I've seen a lot of different, you know, but I've, I've met a lot of nice people now and they they can't get enough of me now, you know, because I'm the last one of the canal boat people now. Uh, my children don't know nothing about it and uh, I'm the last generation. I was born on a boat, yes, I was a, a child of nine children and uh, I was the third oldest and I was the only one that was born on a canal boat. My mother couldn't get to the hospital soon enough to have me, so she had me on a canal boat. And um, my dad had gone off to get some fish and chips. And uh, when he came back, my mother didn't tell him that she got me. He just said, Honey, what are you doing in bed? So she said, I just felt tired, she said. So she eaten the, the chips and that with my dad. And then she said, Would you like this, George? And she reached over into the bed and picked me up. And passed me to my dad. He didn't know as he'd got me. <laughs> <laughs> so he was over the moon, yeah. I bet he was. Yeah, he was, yeah. So he got, he got fish and chips and a new and daughter. And a new daughter, yes. Welcome to The Ways of Water, a podcast series exploring our English waterways through the arts, ecology, industrial history, well-being and the deep mysteries of water itself. Presented by me, David Bramwell, and with the occasional guest appearances from the inimitable John Shuttleworth and his neighbour Ken. So there were 11 of you living living on the same boat? Uh, at, at any... There was two boats, like, but uh, as time went on, there would be 11. But by then, us older ones, we had boats of our own then. We had to go on boats, work in another pair, or, or, or a single motor, they called it. With us three girls, we had to sleep on the uh, butty, as we called it. That's got no engine in. We used to sleep under my mum and dad's bed. Because we, because we were girls, and then we, there was two boys then on the on the motor where the engine was, and um, yeah, but I think there's a lot of tales going round at the minute, as we all slept in drawers and that. But I don't know where it comes from. You know, I had this happen on rally last week, and I said to this woman, I said, "Well, I come off a family of nine. I said, but I don't ever remember my mother putting any children in a drawer. I said because. Uh, it wasn't done. I said, we needed that space for our bedding and clothes because we hadn't got a lot, of, a lot of room on there anyway, so we couldn't put the kids in there. And I said, and I've also been on the canals with my daughter and she was never in a drawer. So. Did, did music play much of a role in, oh, in your childhood? Yes, yes, of course. We, we used to have the gramophones. Not the, uh, the, the, we had battery ones when we got them bit older but we had the wind up ones yeah. and we used to what we used to do when all the boat people got together the kids used to get the gramophones and take it off in the field and we all used to dance in the field doing jiving and everything yeah so yeah we did like music yeah what kind of cargo were you carrying um when i, I lived in the pottery as my parents used to carry china clay and then uh, we'd have flour uh, fish scales uh, like the big cobbles, we used to carry those. Um, Felspar. Oh, there's a lot of cargo, yeah. Mm. When we got up in the morning, it would be six o'clock. And then we'd be going till about ten or eleven o'clock at night. So when I had to cook meals, I had to, my husband used to I would say to my husband, I'm going in to make some food. So he used to shorten the boat up to his boat. So... He could guide the two boats while I'm inside making some food. Mm. And then he'd come back with his motor to get the food off of me and then go. So we'd be eating going along the canal. We'd never stop to eat because you lost time. You couldn't lose any time because you'd have other boats coming behind you. So that would throw you behind, you see, if they took over you. So you had to keep going. And if uh, the nights was nice, we'd go on a bit further if it, later than... 10 o'clock, past 10. It'd be 11, 12, 1 o'clock sometimes. We were tying up at night. So then by the time we got tied up, we'd have something to eat and then we'd be going again at 4 or 5 o'clock the next morning. So you had to keep going, Duck, because if you didn't, you didn't get any money. Gave me. 
a horse, a boat and you. That comes from my mum and dad when they was courting. And uh, my dad said to me, Mum, he said, all I want, Annie, is a horse, a boat and you. <laughs> and that's what he got. <laughs> yeah, and he did get her, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was me and my husband. We were moored up there at Bulls Bridge expecting our first child, Denise. And how old were you when, when you had your first? 17. First, you were 17? I had another one by the time I was 19. And I went to 14 years and then I had another one. Right. <laughs> so I've got three children, yes. That was my wedding photo. I was frightened. Were you? I was frightened, yeah. I didn't know if I was doing the right thing, to be honest. <laughs> but we, we did, we, we stayed together. I got married at Coventry Registrar. And what did you do to celebrate? We went day? down to uh, Sutton Stop. Uh, there's a pub there, I don't know if you've ever been. Just down the canal here. Yeah? And uh, we went in there and the people said to me, would you like a drink, Alice? I said, well, I don't drink. I never drank, you say. So uh, I said, I'll have a baby shower. So the landlady of the pub, she come over to me, she said, Alice, she said, Make that your last one, she said. She said, I know it's your wedding day, she said, but you're not old enough to drink, which I wasn't. <laughs> I was 17. So I said, OK. She told me off. <laughs> <laughs> we made our life it, what we wanted to. Yeah. We did, you know, so. And if I'd got the chance to go back there without children, I would never take my children back on a boat. Because I knew I'd lost out on a lot of things when I was a young woman. Mm. What is it you feel that you missed out on then, growing, growing up on the going boat? Going out like you people, going out to clubs and nightclubs and going and having a good time and, and, and uh, meeting other people, uh, like other blokes, and other than the boat chaps. We never got to go with boys on the shore or anything like that. Yeah. You know, I think that's what I... Cause, you don't know, you might have met somebody else entirely different. We don't know that now, do we? How did it feel to live in your first house? This was my first house. Oh, right. Yes, yeah. We, we, when we left the boats, we, we'd got a bit of savings, me and my husband, so he said, shall I go and buy a caravan? So he went and bought a brand new caravan at Longford here, and uh, we lived in it for five years to save to get us a house. And we've been here, f well, I've been here now 54 years nearly. And uh, yeah, I, it was lovely. It was like coming into a big mansion. Mm. But I did like my caravan better. Because I think what it was, because it was little like my boat. And, and I used to see more people about, but in this house, I'm in this house, I hardly see anybody about. You know, if I need to go out, I've got to go outside. I cannot stop in the house all the time. I've got to get outside. <laughs> and you think that comes from growing up um, on the boat? That, I think so, yeah. I think it's because it's the fresh air and meeting people, because we always met people when we was on the canals. But when you're in houses... And the worst thing I think I had to do was when I went and got a job. I, I, I mean, I had no experience of anything, so... I thought, well, what can I do? And the first job I got was a cleaning job at an old people's home. And I was there for 11 and a half years. And I loved that job. And then after that, I just branched into, into factories, working full time all night. Yeah, so you or me. We never went, never went on holiday, never had holidays. We never, never thought about it when you were boating because you were always on the boat, so you never thought about holidays. And the first time I ever saw the seaside, uh, I was 21. And me and my husband went to, I think it was Blackpool or somewhere we went. Yarmouth, Great Yarmouth. And uh, Les said to me, he said, look at that over there, Alice, and it was the sea. And both of us were fascinated because we'd never seen it. And I said, I wonder if there's a side to that, you know, because we've only ever known little canals, you know. And then when we see that big sea, we just couldn't believe it. And we were fascinated, both of us. I think a lot of it was to do with us. We hadn't got the education then. When we left the canals, we, me and my husband, we went to a night school and... We learned quite a bit, so that got us through. Mm. 
You know. So how did you cope with reading and writing when you were young? Did, we did, did you learn those skills sufficiently? No, 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 no. We never. We didn't know nothing about reading and writing until we left the canals. I mean, my, my dad could read and write because he went to school uh, for a little while because they lived on the shore at Longport. So dad went to school and had a bit of sco uh, schooling. But uh, us kids, there was, I think there's only one out of our family that could read and he went to the home in Birmingham. So when did you learn? I learned when I was, what, was, what would I be now? What would I be? 26, 26, and I'm still learning. And uh, I think I'm up to the uh, townies' uh, standards now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember, uh, uh, um, what would it be? About I'd be about nine, ten. Dad said, I'm going to get you some new shoes, Alice, because I was wearing my brother's boots. And uh, because I didn't care, you see. So he said, I'll go and get you some new shoes. And this was in Runcorn near Liverpool. And he come back and he bought these brown lace-up shoes. And when I seen them, I thought, oh, my God, I'm not wearing them. <laughs> so anyway... I had to put them on because I'm oh, sorry about your shoes, but these were these was brown lace-ups. Anyway, I said, I'm not wearing them, Dad. He said, you are. He said, because you're not getting no more. He wouldn't buy another pair. So I said, OK. So where, where we moored up, there were some toilets, but they've got a big glass top on them. There was the old type toilets with, like, the bubble glass on it. And we always played on there because there was a street lamp there, a gas lamp. Mm. And uh, my cousin was playing about with me and he grabbed this shoe off me and he put it in, in this gas lamp. And he went down, he didn't he? Brand new shoes. So I had to go back to the boat and tell me dad, as George had put me bloody shoe down this gas bar. He went mad. He said, you've got to go and get it back. I said, we can't, dad, it's gone right down the lamp. And do you know that gas lamp's still there? And I bet my shoe's still in there as well. <laughs> Well, it just remains for me to thank my guest and... Oh, oh, hang on, that sounds like the post. The cassette. Ah, from my old friend in Sheffield, John Shuttleworth, containing, I suspect, some of his wonderful, weird, watery wisdom. Welcome to John Shuttleworth's fantastical... And occasionally foolish... Facts from the weird but wonderful world of waterways. Thanks, Ken. You're welcome. The Barton Aqueduct on the Bridgewater Canal was the first navigable aqueduct ever built in England and was mockingly nicknamed Brindley's Castle in the Air. What material did James Brindley use to build a model of it and thus silence his critics? Was it A, cork, B, clay, or C, cheese? Hmm. Uh, I think it was cork, so it would float. No, Ken. No, uh, clay. No, I'm afraid, Ken, it was C, cheese. Really? Oh, what type of cheese? No idea, can't help you there. Stilton, surely. Because an aqueduct is, you know, it's on stilts. <laughs> Stilton. Or possibly Edam, because, you know, it goes across a dam. Edam. Get it? No. My cheese was better, John. Oh. Bye bye for now. Bye, David. Hope to see you in Brighton on the pier sometime. Bye. Bye. Ways of Water was presented by me, David Bramwell, and with music by Oddfellows Casino. Find out more via drbramwell.com and check out Oddfellows Casino on Bandcamp, where you'll also find links to my album and book, The Cult of Water. Many thanks to all the guests in this series and to you, the listener. Watery blessings to you all.